Cool. Do you want to just pass it back and forth? Yeah. All right. Okay, so we're co-presenting, so bear with us. So yeah, cool. So we're here to present on <clears throat> the future of Gitcoin grants. Um, I'm going to take a minute to maybe kind of like define the meta problem a little bit, just so we kind of know what we're, we're really kind of going for. Um, and that's really about how we scale up capital provisioning. Do you want to take the next one? Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. We have a Slido. Maybe you want to take a minute. You can pull this up on your phones. And this is how we're going to do Q&A here. So if you want to ask a question, I promise that's a safe QR code. <laughs> I come talk to Leon if you see anything. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll use that to like guide the conversation after we get through it. But yeah, feel free to answer, enter questions in there, vote up questions. Yeah. I'm still seeing cameras. I'll wait for you guys to wrap it up. Unfortunately, low key voting, not quadratic. That's not. <laughs> All right, cool. So, do you want to do this one? Cool. So this is, we're kind of borrowing this from Glenn Weil. Um, he did a presentation on this. But this is kind of trying to set up these kind of thoughts, these camps, I guess, that we see as kind of issues <laughs> that are coming up in the future. Um, the first one, corporate libertarianism. Maybe you want to take this? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's like kind of the ideology that's very present in like the Bitcoin maximalist community. But even in like kind of very high tier Silicon Valley um, Peter Thiel like takes on the future of technology where like basically they're advocating or predicting the end of all forms of social organization that we know like the fall of the nation states the fall of companies and we'll only have trustless networks like Bitcoin and the sovereign individuals that hold their keys kind of in these networks so obviously that doesn't sound so <laughs> positive if you if you like and then there is like a kind of other dominant thing I would say in technology where you have, um, you know, kind of the artificial general intelligence predictors. They give us another kind of vision of the future where they say, okay, we'll have this super powerful computer that will rule everybody, every human being, and like we will only have this top-notch computer that controls everybody or we'll have billionaires kind of doing effective altruism and like directing like capital to causes and yeah that's also I think not really desirable to like leave all these decisions to um, right a, a few handful of people governing the planet and the vision that Gitcoin kind of is trying to advocate for sees itself in is like plural democracy um, you might have seen like what the radical exchange movement is up to, uh, founded by Glenn Weil, like basically developing markets and like democracy mechanisms that are like truer to the richness of you know our diverse lives. Because indeed, actually, we we have so much collective intelligence and like diversity everywhere. Like we we care about all kinds of communities and. The vision here is basically let's augment these communities, give them tools to make them stronger and foster cooperation between them. And this is kind of what we we want to do with Gitcoin too. Like just the analogy there is kind of Star Trek maybe where you have this very diverse like space of all kinds of different beings that cooperate with each other and live in their very um, particular but nevertheless like compatible cultures. And basically our vision is to increase social cultural diversity and, and foster cooperation between these different groups. I don't know. Do you want to add to that? I think that's good. So I, yeah, I guess the last thing we'll say about uh, that is a lot of the, I think inspiration comes from yeah, Radical Exchange, but also uh, V Taiwan, a lot of interesting experiments in digital democracy that we think are, yeah, kind of helping, helping like that, that deeper coordination. So a little bit about Gitcoin. Everyone knows Gitcoin, I think, uh, but you know an example of some of the stuff we've been able to do here. So we've so far provisioned 60 million in capital total to projects, to open source public goods projects. Um, there's some logos, they're impressive logos. We've <laughs> recently done some interesting things. We branched out more into causes too. We've had a climate round, uh, some advocacy rounds. We've done some uh, longevity uh, rounds, and then most recently in our last round, we did uh, some humanitarian aid 
for Ukraine. So we're branching out beyond just open source and into some more sort of general public goods. Maybe you want to talk about how it works. Yeah. Yeah? Go for it. So yeah, our core product is a platform called Gitcoin Grants. And on Gitcoin Grants, you basically have three core roles. So you have like a matching fund that usually comes in Gitcoin's case from philanthropic organizations like the Ethereum Foundation that want to support the Ethereum ecosystem. And we have all these projects in the Ethereum ecosystem, right? So it's difficult for them to decide like what project will we give how much capital or should we give them capital at all? So basically on Gitcoin, you can create your project and like say, hey, we are doing this new layer two thing and we want support. And, <laughs> and then uh, the community can kind of donate to your project and on the like, the green or white fields on this screen where it says contribution, are these contributions or donations from the community? And then based on these contributions, you see the, the yellow area, which represents matching from the philanthropic organization like Ethereum towards these contributions. So on the left hand side, you have to imagine like this, is a, like this whole square is a total match that a project would get in, like the total funding a project would get in Gitcoin grants. So let's say this is, you know, this layer two project, then one of these squares represents my donation to it, well, the other square represents Kevin's donation, there's another square that represents Ligi's and one from Maurice. And basically, you take the square roots of each of these contributions, like the square root of $9 is three, you add up these square roots, so the whole length of that square is basically the sum of the squares, and then you take the square of of that length and you get this square that you see there, the big square. And then the, the difference basically between the size of that square and the contributions is the match that'll come from Ethereum. So, or like the philanthropists. So what it does in the end is it rewards people if they contribute. Because if you like this project, you can anticipate, right, that there'll be more yellow area if you add to it. So we, in the first place, give people incentive to donate to these projects. And on the other hand, philanthropists don't need to check all these like thousands of projects, but can kind of harness the collective intelligence to distribute the funding that they have available. And this is kind of the graphic in, in math on the right hand side there where C is these contributions. Um, but yeah, happy to go into that further. So we've done that basically, um, but there are some dangers to good congrats. Um, so one obvious one is that you can imagine, like, you could set up many robots that make donations on your behalf. And because you take the square root of the donation, like, many small donations get more matching than, like, one big giant one. So if you did that, you could basically get, you know, this large amount of matching funding <laughs> that's, like, coming down on these <laughs> people. <laughs> Thanks to Fred from GitCon for making that meme. And... Um, yeah, basically, we've started working on that. You know, there's all kinds of projects in the space that try to prove that you're a human, like a unique participant in these systems. But I think there are also harder cases, and this is kind of the evolution of Gitcoin grants and, like, one of the next big challenges that we'll need to tackle. Even, like, the first problem is bigger than you might think um, in a trustless setting. So, but, but the harder cases are, like, very natural uh, things like family and friends, like... You know, should it really be matched if my girlfriend and I support the same project on Gitcoin Grants? Like, should it have the same match amount as opposed to me and someone who is very different from me support the same project? Um, because imagine, like, we, we do very small quadratic funding thing. I don't know, Kevin Olson, my girlfriend and I. <laughs> then we'd be, like, inherently, like, we, ha we could dominate the matching funding because we share more interests than the two of us, in a way. And, and you have that at all kinds of scales, right? If the city of Berlin said, hey, we have this matching fund, tax money to support streets and public parks, um, basically, it's very likely, I don't know, that Kreuzberg will win because it has like most inhabitants, right? Because the Kreuzberg people will naturally support everything in Kreuzberg, but it shouldn't really count just because they are more. Or if you scale it really big to like nation state scale or like just five billion participants in Gitcoin grants, it's very likely that most of the matching would go to a Chinese project because if you take the square of like one billion one dollar donations, that's like not gonna be. I think there's not another like very 
large uh, homogeneous group like that that share so many interests. And these things aren't necessarily bad. I don't want to frame it as like malicious collusion. It's just natural human interest. And it's kind of a problem that Len Weil identified with quadratic funding that, or like any economic system, if we zoom, and it's kind of, I know some of you have probably been to like business school, like you, you get taught like, okay, like all our models only work if we assume that we are isolated, rational beings, but we're the opposite of that, right? Like Kreuzberg people care about Kreuzberg and their friends and their family and about Germany, maybe, maybe they're part of the Greens party. Like maybe they like the Ethereum community more than the Polygon community. So we actually, you know, like not selfish at all. Like everything is about love and like being in social networks. And what we're trying, basically if we ignore that reality, all of the matching funding in even like a complex or like more innovative voting mechanism like quadratic voting or funding, all of that reward from the mechanism will go to the largest homogeneous group un unless we could kind of solve that. And, and there's some things like some early responses to these problems. So one, as I said, is the trust verification where we just try to make sure that you are human, like aggregating different signals that kind of show, okay, you, you might be somebody because you've been through proof of humanity and bright ID and some other solutions like that. And, and then there is something called pairwise uh, quadratic funding, which is basically just a different way to compute the quadratic funding formula. I'll quickly show that on this other slide. So instead of taking the, the square of the sum of the square roots, we could basically look at, I mean, <laughs> it's weird, <laughs> like go up here and uh, <laughs> you could also right, take the square of this contribution, the square root I mean, and the square root of that contribution, and then calculate the size of that rectangle here, take it twice, so we have the pairwise match basically for that pair of people. And, and then you take that person with that person and you get this rectangle, right? So basically we will just, instead of taking the global kind of match value, we'll calculate these uh, fields here like pair by pair and add them up in the end. And, and now I show you why this is interesting. So here's just an example of that. Imagine like Kevin and I would both donate to Go Ethereum, the guest client. Then like the math version of what I showed there is just taking two times the square root of Kevin's donation to Geth times the square root of my donation to Geth. And now the cool thing is that for any pair of agents, we can give them like an arbitrary pairwise matching weight given some evidence for the social proximity that they have. So I know in, here's a way to kind of think this through. Um, so Kevin is American, I'm German. Like, so he could basically have a soul bond token or, or some piece of data that proves his American citizenship, my German citizenship. Now we're both based in Kreuzberg. Woo! <laughs> like, <laughs> um, uh, you know, so we could have some attestation that proves that we both work at Gitcoin, and and now like basically a very simple try at at quantifying that relationship could be that we just take the number of shared credentials. So in Kevin's in my case, that would be two, right? And take it over the number of uh, total credentials or the mean of total credentials. So if you Calculate that you like basically take going back to K, which is the matching weight that we have, right? Um, together, we basically could just subtract that proximity. So if we had a very high proximity, like you know we we have the same friends, we go to the same events, we like work at the same place. I know maybe we have kids together, like you know like it would very likely be like 0.9 or 0.95, you know, and we'd have a very low matching weight together this way. But if we'd be kind of not cooperating so much and like living in different continents, different countries, different job, different friends, different interests, it'll likely be a very low social proximity. So you get like a, a low, a high matching weight. So in that case, we'd have two over three credentials in common and um, the, the matching weight then would be one third. So basically if, I don't know, the match for Kevin and me would be six, we'll just take that match times one third and kind of reduce it that way. And this, although this is like a very simple <laughs> a 
approximation, like obviously like there's so much room for improving these algorithms and like different contexts will need different algorithms. So if we do like um, quadratic funding in the Ethereum ecosystem, it might be very relevant what DAOs you belong to, like what PoAPs you hold or like what rollups you're using and stuff like that. Whereas if you did quadratic funding for causes in Berlin, it would be re very relevant like in what neighborhood you live, uh, what school you went to, or you know, it's very different variables are very relevant. So basically, we need a lot of innovation in like figuring out how to approximate uh, sociality between people. But even that simple thing, I think, could make Gitcoin grants way more meaningful in the sense that even if we just knew, for instance, like what grants you've contributed to in the past and were calculating the matches that way, we would have way more pluralistic results in the matching because we'd increase, gradually increase the matching for like people who have usually contributed to different projects. You know, when they now cooperate, we'll give them a high reward. And uh, people who have always supported the same thing would kind of get a lower, lower reward. And it's literally like, a, sometimes called it like a Ponzi scheme for diversity. Because, you know, like, if people are different, they'd, like, support the, and they support something, then, okay, they get a high reward, but now we could issue some token that shows that they supported the same thing. So next time they support the same thing, they'll already be, like, represented that way as, like, one community. So we always only reward the people who are different and support the same thing and kind of maximize diversity in this very programmatic <laughs> Way, um, yeah. So, yeah, Kevin, yeah, sure. do you want to talk about how we want to build that stuff? <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, that was great. Thanks, Leon. Um, I think maybe just one bit of context. I'm not sure. Maybe this is in the appendix or something like that. But um, a lot of this thinking comes from the recent DSOC paper that came out. I'm sure I'm seeing some heads nod. So a lot of this, I think they're calling this the correlation index. If you go all the way into the appendix, they, they go through exactly how they're thinking about calculating this. A lot of this, what, what Leon's saying is about getting this, you know, un understanding what communities you belong to in a, in a way that's, um, you know, privacy preserving. Um, I mean, this is a project that we've, we've got underway. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, but this does let you innovate on other, like, sort of evolutions of quadratic funding. Right, so uh, a little bit about where we're headed with with we're calling it grants too. We don't have a product marketer. If you're a product marketer, come talk to us. But we're just calling it what <laughs> what we call it. So these are kind of like engineering terms. Um, so for grants too, one of the one of the key things is uh, a passport project. So we've actually been building this on top of ceramic with uh, Joel's team's help. Um, so weird small world moment tonight, <laughs> but. Um, so that's actually uh, DIDs and VCs where, like, we, that, you saw the trust bonus slide a few bits back. Oh, man, it's way back there. This one. So this, if you've ever donated to Gitcoin grants, we have a trust bonus. So we're already doing some attenuation around civil behavior. So we've already tried to help, like, if, if you can prove that you're a rich human being with many uh, different data points and you're willing to link those things to your account, you already can earn a trust bonus, right? So this brings your matching weight from starting at like 50% up to 100, past that to 150 if you really fill up your, your, your passport, so to speak. So we've decentralized this and we've built this on top of Ceramic, um, launching for GR14, which is like in a couple weeks. So um, that's the plan. The interesting thing there is that's actually gonna be self-sovereign. So you're actually, no longer this data doesn't sit inside Gitcoin monolith. It's actually gonna sit out on the uh, Ceramic network. It'll be data that you own, you sign it with your own keys. Um, and is ultimately non, there's no PII contained within it. It's really just that our system, as you've gone through this dApp, sees that you have these different links and will issue you verifiable, verifiable credentials that you uh, can, we can then you present later as that passport to other systems around on Gitcoin or otherwhere, other places that allow you to uh, prove that you are a unique human being. So this is kind of an anti civil public good that we're gonna be releasing here pretty soon. So as you look at grants too, um, one of the key parts of this obviously is that you, you like quadratic funding, quadratic voting, all of these things rely on kind of one person, one vote. So that's, that's what's represented by souls there, not to be controversial or anything like that. We're not really dictating how you necessarily need to do that. We've chosen to use this particular uh, system. But grants too is really gonna be a decomposition of what grants on Gitcoin is now. Uh, it's really, think of it as a toolkit where you can uh, deploy your own copy of Gitcoin grants, uh, run it yourself. 
um, or you can customize it. So the key components there, right, that you can identify with people as they vote, that they are individuals, so that's, that's gonna be the password project. We have a project hub that's coming out also you're, if you're collecting uh, your donations, uh, sorry, your, uh, your payout, if you come and claim your payout on a Gitcoin grant this next round, you'll be prompted to add your project to the new distributed registry. Um, that's a key part of making sure that we're creating the space where again, project owners really own their data about uh, the description of their project, also gives you a place for that one project to kind of live on its own, again, outside of, of Gitcoin. Uh, you'll be able to apply to various ecosystem rounds through that. So again, we're kind of inverting this relationship where you create a grant application that lives on Gitcoin, and uh, you know you get kind of selected based on tagging and stuff what round you belong in, and, and there's a kind of a whole appeals process. It's the other way around. So as these self-sovereign rounds get sort of spun up in the ecosystem, you'll be able to apply to them through the, the project hub. And then lastly, we have this this top, which is the plural capital provision arrangements, which is really indicating all of these different ways that people can experiment with it. So so Gitcoin's landed on pairwise quadratic funding or pairwise matching, right? Uh, it's been good for us, right? It's worked. It's, I think it's driven a certain amount of like strong you know, uh, signal from communities and people keep giving us money to help them distribute to projects, so it seems to be working. Um, but we think there might be better things, right? So the idea is that if we can kind of give all of these components out there, people can start experimenting and speed running these other things, right? So already there's some really interesting projects, Retro PGF, uh, you have Macy's, more privacy preserving approaches to this. And then what Leon was just presenting around uh, sort of the, the DSOC approach to quadratic funding could be something that could be easily built on top of all of these new uh, decentralized registries and tools that we're gonna be releasing on top of this. So piece by piece, you're gonna start seeing this come together over the next few Gitcoin rounds until ultimately this is how we run Gitcoin is I'm gonna be on top of this system. So yeah, I think that's kind of where we're at. Maybe it's time to start doing questions? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you can come find us here. Oh. Oh yeah, lastly, if you want to keep on top of this, uh, we do have the governance forum for Gitcoin. Leon, every Monday, is taking all of the team's updates and consolidating them as GovPost. So you're definitely gonna be able to keep on top of what's happening and what's getting built. There's links to everything from design files to uh, the repos to the in progress like demo environments. You should be able to get your hands on this and play with it. And we'd love your feedback. Um, find us on Discord. We have a Grants2 channel that's open. We can make it more open if you are interested. Um, yeah, come talk to us there. Oh yeah, and we're hiring. Sorry, I have to show that too. So. <laughs> One more, <laughs> one more link. All right, cool. Do you want to do the Slido? Yeah, I can at least uh, try to find it. Let's see if we have questions. Yeah, cool. What do you think are the biggest risks and opportunities with so on tokens? Um, oh, can I highlight that here? Yeah. Thank you for that question, Vincent. Um, I feel like Silbon token to me is more of a meme than a particular technology choice or arrangement. So all we're kind of, I think all what it means to me really is like, let's build something, like let's give you some credential at a station that kind of claims, okay, Leon lives in Kreuzberg, for example, right? And it's not easy for me to transfer that to somebody else. Right, so I feel like there's hundreds of ways to implement that, probably on public blockchains, probably on networks like ceramic, probably even on like more like I mean think about all the like even analog kind of stuff that you hold that is really bound to you like through very rudimentary like eighteenth century technology, I think like faking passports is kind of hard, right um I don't know, never tried, but I feel like. I'm excited to see that like more and more projects like after the DSOC paper dropped like try it out to, to build some Sobon token standard or to issue Sobon tokens. Gitcoin will likely like issue more and more tokens into this or verifiable credentials into this ceramic uh, identity that we're building to those Joel. So I, I don't think there's like, uh, I'm not really ideology, 
ideological about it. Anyway, like the risks are obviously that it, like, I mean, if you would design it very poorly and had a lot of power, you could kind of build something like the social credit scoring system in China or whatever, but, or like Facebook or Google. But um, obviously, I think kind of two core values that you should follow, like two goals is that it should be really accountable and transparent, like who has access to what data, when and where. And then the use of that data or like should be, and the control of it should be really aligned with the people that are bound to it. And I feel like if we, like there's probably not one solution, but tons. And yeah, the opportunity is obviously to, to really use it and make Web3 way more um, meaningful because we can go beyond like only hyper-financialization, but also build like very meaningful social institutions through like more plural iterations of quadratic funding or like having more uh, plural market mechanisms where like different people pay at different tax rates based on their sociality relating to some community. I think there's like all kinds of cool stuff we could build with it. I don't know, do you have? I think you covered a lot of ground. <laughs> I, I guess like the thing that people cl classically talk about is like the non-consensual sold down token the like scarlet letter sold down token that that people kind of use and i think ultimately it we decided not to go with an on-chain uh concept for our need for like some sort of a soul right in our system if you're trying to prove one person one vote um as quadratic funding needs that um we opted not to take that on chain and we kept that on the ceramic network so that we're uh, again also using um the VCs as the way to sort of denote your membership to a particular identity providing system or to uh, a community in the future. So I think it's one of those things, I think the ultimate technology will, yeah, as Leon said, evolve, but right now I think it, it unfortunately, like, I think the, the name has sort of like steered everyone at a particular implementation. Um, I don't think that that's necessary. Is there any way to like get into some dialogue here? Are there follow-ups? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, this I like. I like this question. Okay, so uh, is there a risk to politicizing the camps of these these various ideologies that we put forward? Um, so, I, so like I honestly think that the idea is that you should have this kind of multipolar world, right, where these these three ideologies actually coexist. I think you want the tension of all three. Um, I really hope that one of them doesn't just win, right? I, I mean, uh, I think you'll you'll find people gravitating towards all, and hopefully there's some sort of you know virtuous cycle that happens by having ideas moving between them. Um, I think just where I want to spend my energy, where I think <laughs> where we where we uh, uh, are building is more in that um, sort of digital democracy space or or, or you know uh, pluralistic space. Um, I think a lot of that for me comes from this interest in building for the people who are alive now <laughs> and have problems now uh, and needs versus you know the distant future. But I'm glad that people are thinking about the distant future. I just don't want them to only fund the distant future and not people now. Like one thought that I had is that at least the plural democracy or the pluralism vision, I mean, explicitly wants to recognize different socio-cultural ecosystems and foster cooperation between them, which is kind of what you said. But it's so I think if if the corporate libertarians, when we might end up, you know, with only one singularity, or same with the synthetic technocracy, but at least there's like pluralism will kind of win. I think we'll be able to like have like a I don't know. Glenn said in one of his papers, like a lush rainforest of like interconnected social groups that like um, cooperate through the internet and in person and everywhere. Um, I feel like with these like more innovative digital or like plural democracy tools, we could really, yeah, build Ponzi schemes for diversity, um, <laughs> which sounds cool. How are you going to compute social proximity for accounts that have no attestations? How do you differentiate a newcomer from a Sybil? Um, yeah, that's a, 
that's kind of like the second question maybe depends i i, I think kind of on when you will do this um so one pretty cool thing about these meaningful attestations about like who you are like where you live what university you went to what high school you went to is actually that if you imagine we had like all these attestations about like a 20 year old person we'd have like okay the the kids of that person grew up in this place like because they were registered there right um went to this high school now started studying at that university if you have like these credentials from like this trusted university government some peers like family and friends like proving personal is actually not very hard at all because you know like okay like this is obviously somebody right he's like studying there has this friends that family like it's it's very not an issue then anymore but and and the funny thing is that as you grow up you'll collect more and more of these attestations so pr likely at the latest when you're like for certain age you'll be able to participate in these democratic mechanisms if you know basically the way you could do it as an administrator is like query some random tokens that you trust like i don't know you trust german universities and the german government and some DAOs in the ethereum space and if you have a bunch of like tokens from these institutions it very likely means that you're human right like because they won't all like just give certificates to like you know non-humans <laughs> and yeah so I, th I think one, one thing uh that i want to say on this one is uh yeah it's really hard to bootstrap obviously like this this whole solar soul bound world right so i think we have the luxury of having fairly motivated people people are trying to donate to causes they care about they're already there they're hopefully incentivized to get over the free rider problem and do something to help draw some matching uh, funds to a project that they care about. So in the past, we've had the trust bonus. We've shown that people are willing to go through that and link a few accounts. Um, so I think we're going to hopefully bootstrap a little bit of that just through having just the, the nature of, of the grant ecosystem. Um, I, there was an interesting thing. The last thing I'll say, kind of piggybacking on what you're saying. So, so the short answer is you can't tell that apart. We're not going to like go and try to like figure out where you came from if you don't go through and present a, a passport when you arrive. So we're going to hopefully incentivize people through this sort of trust bonusing mechanism, at least for Gitcoin. So that, that's how we're, we're approaching it. Um, in terms of what, what Leon was saying, there's this moment where I, I, I was, someone was talking about this, which is like, you know, even when you have these identity systems like passport and IDs, if you ever get a, a job that's very secure, they're going to do a background check on you. That's actually how any intelligence agency, any police, whatever, that's, that's how they actually, they don't really even trust the ID that you present them. That's not like the truth. They're going to go talk to your parents, your whatever spouse. They're going to like try to figure out who you are really. Um, so there's already like a precedent for needing this sort of like community of attestations to prove that you're really who you say you are when, when it's really trust is needed at that level. So it's a useful metaphor when we think about why this idea of like declaring your sort of community affiliations is sort of like pre-background screening yourself. Uh, and if you can do that in a privacy preserving way, which we think you can, um, you should be in a place to actually have a much better trust that that person really is a real human being and are participating authentically. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't, ran out of water. Um, so to protect the pr privacy of the souls, this is great. So our our current uh, plan right now is to contain no no personally identifiable information. So all they are right now is a passport that's connected to a did. Oh, thank you. <laughs> is um is your passport is connected to a did, um, which is um, again not personally identifiable. You know, it, it, it did does not track track back to to you in any meaningful way. All of the verifiable credentials that we're issuing are, um, again, contain no PII, just that it was issued by a, a, an, an issuer uh, that is a trusted source and that it's observed the connection to that other system. So what we're doing right now is, if you're as you go through and you create a stamp in your passport, if you open an OAuth session to Google, for instance, we're observing that connection and we're issuing a verifiable credential that our system saw that connection. And at that point in time, you can trust that passport was issued by a trusted system. Um, 
that you can then trust the other person. At one point, at the point that that was issued, they had a, access to that uh, a Google account, right? So as you're thinking about all of these pointers back towards a person, these stamps are really just pointing at, we observe this person having access to those systems or belonging to those communities. It really, uh, outside of being able to like, completely map all terrain and then figure out that unique footprint of a person, I think this is a pretty safe way to reference uh, a soul in a way that these systems require. So yeah, no, no PII, there's no like encrypted credentials or anything like that that you have to then like present and then get decrypted. Um, we're keeping it just the observed event is what is really represented in the VCs or the stamps that are going into the current passport. So hope, hit me up if you <laughs> have worries about that. Um, Um, yeah, I think selecting like the credentials for the quadratic funding scoring, for instance, will be very, um, yeah, it will likely be a unique choice for whoever is administrating that quadratic funding program, right? So let's say you were funding Creative Commons music through like Get Grants 2.0, then you would likely want some data about like what concerts and festivals people go to what music they listen to usually, like what kind of discotheques maybe they go to. And <laughs> um, that would likely be meaningful in the sense that you want to like support or reward the grants that receive donations from both the techno and the like rock community and not just the big techno community in Berlin. So you'd identify these projects that are kind of appealing to, to the broad society, not just one large homogeneous group in society. And in turn, if we do Gitcoin, like we might very likely, uh, like the grants from that you know, which is mostly about funding open source software, it'll likely be relevant, like what <coughs> GitHub organizations you work with or what um, Ethereum communities you interact with. So it, it's really a question of, A, what data is available? Or like how can we make that available and then I think it really depends on what diversity means in, in the context of that particular community, right? If it's like an open source community, diversity maybe means like what repositories you work with or like make pull requests to. And if you do quadratic funding for like public parks in Berlin, it's very relevant like what neighborhood you live in, right? So it's like, I, th I think obviously there won't be like, and even, even like for one community, like I think every community is unique, so there won't be like, even, but even in one unique community, there won't be a perfect algorithm. It's just, I think, an op approximation problem of like trying to approximate social distance in a context. I like the, I'm not convinced at all there will be a perfect algorithm, but what I can say is that the hyper-individualist quadratic funding that we do now, where we only know you are human, but we don't approximate at all what social cultural like, communities you interact with in that ecosystem, I think that is doomed to fail because you implicitly give rise to the like largest homogeneous group, right? So I, I think it's like probably a never ending research problem that hasn't been researched so much. I guess like Facebook and Google research it, but kind of for the opposite purpose to kind of like grow eco chambers or like <laughs> Chinese party tries to make society homogeneous as opposed to diverse. So I think there's like some algorithmic research going on and like mapping out social graphs, like for sure but it hasn't really been applied to like nurturing plurality really, I think, or like nurturing diversity. Yeah, normally you have two more minutes, so maybe one, one or two questions more. It's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> It feels like you were talking a lot about like we have this ideology and we need the tech and now we're to trying to like get the tech to line up with the ideology but it's like you know like first of all that's a really difficult concept because like we had this entire conversation around like how do you say what is diverse uh, you know because for me I know I have the same background as my family and we're all totally different people so mm. like nationality language school and all of that does not <laughs> apply to me uh, to show a factor of diversity so like first uh, which is you know like how to how do you know you're on the right track uh, 
to, to go into diversity ideology direction. And second, like to see is there some kind of trying to get a feedback, uh, you know, from the projects and see like, okay, uh, do we get a lot of diversity for from people who just so tweet from Elon Musk on Twitter and now they're all like kind of just doing this thing without having any background knowledge and we have the diversity, but we don't necessarily know if we want to listen to those opinions of people who not really interested in the topic, or like, do, do we have like some kind of research behind uh, what, what is the result that we get from this kind of funding uh, opposed to something that has a different method of like, uh, you know, selecting the f funding, like classic crowdfunding? Hmm. Yeah, I feel like just one note is that we haven't experimented with the like explicit plurality algorithms at all yet. It's like two month old kind of formal idea. And we, oh, that one is a bit loud, right? <laughs> I see. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't really tried that out. And But it's an interesting question, like how do you verify good results here or like satisfying results, right? Because like, yeah. I think, I mean, this is gonna sound like maybe a cop out, but the answer is, I think, um, is is opening it up to some experiments. So what we have right now is one way of doing this in Gitcoin, and we run it for all of our different causes, which I think is somewhat limiting, right? Uh, the idea is as soon as this is opened up and folks can start kind of spinning out their own funding mechanisms, you're gonna see people who can point at a better sort of capital allocation. They're happier with results, the projects that got funded. Um, I think also keeping the sort of feedback loop in somewhat smaller communities, meaning not, not the global Gitcoin ecosystem, but if you had a, a small cause around, your community was donating to that and your results were you know, good for that community, hopefully you're in that feedback loop and you'll learn. So our hope is that we can keep all of these different you know, funding rounds that are getting stood up on top of the new platform, uh, protocol rather, that, that we want them to be sort of feeding some of those findings back into each other, right? So that we can all kind of speed run this and find a global maxima, not just the local maxima that Gitcoin might have found. Does that make sense? Maybe just, um, anyway, like the traditional quadratic funding, like which is just individualist, like not measuring really the like sociality of the people. I think even that kind of works and we validate that because you know we give people incentive to donate every quarter to these projects that they care about through the matching fund. And, and even making these small donations, which is kind of like the cool quadratic twist of quadratic funding. And at the same time, it seems to also give some good signal in terms of collective intelligence. So one of the projects, like some of the projects that were like the top recipients in our early grants programs, uh, like two years ago, were like Uniswap, which is now probably, you know, the seed funding from Uniswap basically came through Gitcoin grants. Um, the seed funding of the Prism client, which is now like, leading the research on ETH 2.0 was one of the recipients there, the ZK Tech community uh, podcast thing. So I think like it is like definitely a good tool to harness collective intelligence and with these diversity things, we might make it even richer in that sense. But, and I know we don't have much time left, but this one is a f easy one. So basically we're building this whole grants 2.0 suite, kind of EVM compatible in the first place. So our goal is to make it compatible with any EVM. And from there, I guess we could expand to other. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you very much, guys.